Hello, everybody. Welcome to 110% Athlete Breaking the Slump. I'm Dr. Jess Garza, and with me today, I have an amazing guest. Hi. Um, my name is Romeo Navarro uh, from Austin, Texas. Um, yeah. What do you do? Um, I am, a, I guess, a B-boy. Uh, you guess. Yeah. A, uh, a little bit more than just a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah He's that's... being super modest, everybody. Um, what else do you want to know? Ask me. What else do you do besides B-Boy? Um, I'm a full-time career firefighter. Nice. Yes. That's intense. Yes. So how did you become a firefighter? Like which, which was the love first? B-Boy, firefighting, a mix? Uh, break-in is, uh, you know, I started out when I was younger and um, pretty much Half of my life was I've been b-boying. Oh wow! Um, still do, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I got involved in breaking when I was like ten years old by um, just hearing about all these, um, you know, the movies. You know? Yeah, for that, sure. That's what got me into breaking. But then I started hearing about all these uh, legendary b-boys in Austin. Oh dang! But it kind of died off in 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 the nineties. Yeah. And then I. I still had the love for it, so I brought it back. I wanted to have a crew around like 94, 95. And, oh, wow. And that's how it kind of. That's awesome. So then you became a local firefighter. You're from Austin, went to school for firefighting, became one, and then most firefighters. So my background, I've worked with a ton of firefighters myself mm -hmm. um, up in Arizona and within the military. Many of them struggle with decompression of how to process what they see day in and day out. Um, it's not like a soldier who goes in combat and then comes back to garrison where they get to have like more decompression time to process all of it. Firefighters, first responders, police officers have daily interaction with constant trauma, if you will. Um, how do you decompress? What do you do? Um, so by therapy um, okay. is, is dancing and breaking and um, just the culture, you yeah. know, like, so just teaching kids and just being around that, that, that whole culture as far as breaking and hip hop, oh, that's you know, good. and to me, that's, um, I create new memories, you yeah. know, new memories with the kids and my son is part of a crew. So kind of, that kind of pulled me back into. Oh, that's awesome. Cause I was done teaching breaking, you know, I was just, uh, I produced events. Yeah. No, I wasn't teaching, but I've never wanted to push him. Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't want to push him cause people sometimes push their kids. But they and do. They, and they kind of rebel against it. Oh yeah. Know? I get to see it all the time with yeah. all the athletes that I work with. There's some, there's some parents that. Yeah. So like three days, I mean, three days, three years ago, he was, well, maybe two and a half years ago. He was like, dad, I want to, can you teach me? Can you, can we practice? Yeah. I was like, yes, let's go practice. You're like, hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of like, man, you, you're not going to have fun with me. Right. You're yeah. like, I take it serious. Yeah. No, not, not only that, it's just that I'm your dad and I'm a grown up, right? Right. So this would be a lot more fun if you had a lot of kids, a lot of friends doing mm. this with you. So I called my friends and then Roger and Omar. I was like, yo, I want to start the academy. Yeah. Like 20, 25 kids showed up. Oh, know. wow. Came to find out that some of these parents are like been waiting for me to come out and start teaching again. That's awesome. Yeah, so they're like, yo, we just been waiting for you, Rome. So and now we have now we're now in a two and a half um into the academy. And um he's part of a crew now. And he pulled me back in to all the stuff that I used to do when I was teaching. Oh, that's so cool. Right. And it helped me as far as my therapy, as mm -hmm. far as like being a firefighter, first responder, it's my go-to. So it was hard when COVID was around because mm -hmm. I usually just like um, go out with my, my also my uh, my partner, his name is Roger Davis. He's, okay. He's also a firefighter. Yeah. He's been a firefighter longer than me, but we go out and just dance. We'll go to a club and just go off. Really? Yeah. Nice. So that's one of the ways that you kind of just like release. Like, yes, he knows. He was like, "Yo, it's time. I need, oh, I need you. No questions to ask. You just go." Yeah, I tell my wife, "So I gotta go." <laughs> You're like now. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome that you guys have found that strategy to be able to yeah. utilize. 
because there's a lot that a lot of them that don't have that capability to separate from the job yes. when they get home. Have you ever felt at any point, whether that's in um, as a firefighter or as a b-boy, an imposter syndrome? What is that? Imposter syndrome? Yeah. So imposter syndrome is when <clears throat> I've felt it in myself as a professional where I know all the material theories, techniques to help people perform at their best. But then all of a sudden when I get ready to go and do it, all of a sudden I feel like a fraud. Like they're gonna they're gonna uncover something about me that's not real. Or that I second guess who I am, that I'm not as capable of something else. And so the mentality behind like going full full in, you stop because you're like, well, am I really the right person for this job? Am I really capable of doing this? You freezing? Yeah. Well it's some it's kind of freezing, but almost just second guessing kind of your worth. Like the so for a lot of people in cadet school, um, am I able gonna am I able to do this? Like am I some people are like smaller, not as strong. Yeah. So during the academy, yes, there's times I was like, yo, this career is not for me. Yeah. You know, my body can't do this. This is so hard, you know. But then my firefighter brothers were like, man, put the most important thing in front of you. Yeah. And you put that in your mind. And that's what you do. You go, you you do it because of that important person. Oh, that's great. So I put my son in my face. So whenever I, I'm running out of breath, I'm about to quit, I put him in front of me and I keep going for him. That is awesome. Yes. When we talk about people like understanding their why and their performance, especially <clears throat> because the training demands are so high. And that's yes. not just in like the field that you're in for as a firefighter, but also as a competitive B-boy too. Mm -hmm. Like the hours and the times and resources that you have to take away from your family and your kids, you have to realize what the why is that keeps pushing you a little bit more. Yes. So in, as a firefighter, how do you push past those limits? How are you taught to push back past those limits? By, it's mental, like, you know. <laughs> yes. So during the academy, some of the, some of the guys that are training you, they, they expect you, especially coming from like a V-boy world, I was a civilian. Yeah. You know, oh wow. So most of the most of the guys that are in the academy are like pre-military. They yep. were already went, they they knew what they were getting into. Right. They're prepared for it. I was like I just showed up at orientation is like what's going Hello. on? <laughs> I want to be I want to do this, <laughs> you know? And um during the academy they're like, "Yo, you're not going to make it." You know, like you're going to give up. We know. I was like, "All right." Mm -hmm. You know, so it was it was about just being mentally like Mm -hmm. Telling yourself, man, for you guys to kick me out, I would probably have to die. Yeah. That's the only way you guys are going to kick me out. If I pass out, you bring me back, I'll show up the next day. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, that's the mentality I had to have to just keep going. And once the training, um, when towards the end of the academy, I realized that my body was adapting to the situation. Mm. Yeah. I was getting stronger. I said I can I can last longer, and by the time graduation was over, I was like, "Yo, I can do this." Yeah. You know. And you that, sound like you have like two really significant key points. That one, it's mentality. So, are you born with it or is it developed? What do you think? It came from the break in culture. Ooh, good. To me, I hear that you can develop it. Yes, right. So, like, develop, yes. as I'm in this culture, I can develop mental strength or mental readiness for whatever it is. And then during that process, my body and mind adapt to the situations that I'm experiencing. Yes. And so when we talk about like people that were around, it's pretty critical. When you talk about like the fire brothers that you're with, those are the ones that keep you grounded and sound. The B-boy lifestyle, that culture, the same thing. And so when things are a little bit more tough, having the resilience behind that, mm -hmm. and then the mental fortitude to keep going. Yes. Well, I learned that when the whole world is crashing down, the whole world is in chaos. Mm -hmm. We are trained to calm down and be at our best yeah. and to go yeah. help these people. So if I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm chaotic and I'm panicking, I'm not, I can't help this person. No. I always tell my wife, when every situation does what happened, we got, I got to calm down. So when the whole world's panicking, going down in flames, Yep. I have to be on my best to help. Absolutely. Right. And if I'm not training, if I'm not, even till today, we train as much as we can. I try to train and, yeah. and try to like 
finesse my job so I can be at my best all the time, mm-hmm. right? That's just my mentality came from the breaking world, right? In yeah. the b world, I always look down as like, oh, this this culture of you guys, it, you guys are a bunch of street thug kids, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So that's we've always had to overcome that, like over show the 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 people in the city that yeah. we're not thugs. This is a this is a dance. This is our culture, and this is something that we love, and it helps us and. We made a business out of it. Yeah. And now it's going to be in the Olympics in 2024. That is the coolest thing that I've heard so far. Yes. Like, how do you feel about that? It's awesome. I mean, a lot of people are are against it, but to me, it's just another platform that we could show show that our our talent Mm -hmm. and then for the next generation to show their talent. Yeah. And breaking kept me alive and kept me out of trouble in the streets a lot of my friends ended up being in prison and jail or mm. on drugs you know yeah and that's kind of like the, how society saw us coming from the right low-income projects yeah. and stuff you know but i overcome all that um all that statistic yep. how they saw us oh for sure and it's pretty much what i was in a beep in a, in a fire world that's like you can't do it right what so that mentality is like i'm gonna show you absolutely what what we do with a lot of athletes we call that the threat versus challenge am Mm -hmm. i going to see it as a threat or am i going to see it as an opportunity to embrace and to challenge myself to the next tier to whatever level that i'm wanting to break through yes and so the perspective that you've had on life on training and firehouse and within b-boy is incredible that every opportunity becomes a challenge to you. Yes. And what a role model that you're giving your son. Like, yeah. incredible. <laughs> yes. But it's, it's, it's different from my son, though. I told him, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's a hip-hop. Uh, he comes from a hip-hop world, yeah. but he's, he's not going to be the same because he didn't have the same struggles that I had. True. You know, but he's straight, like, it's, it's a, just a different... He, he won't be... Like, uh, how can I say it? Um, As gritty? Uh, yeah, but he was, he's not like a, a 100% hip-hop. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. Like, hip-hop comes from struggle. Yeah. That's where it came There's from. There's some passion behind it. Yes, yeah, the fire, the hunger, yeah. right? So he's he's pretty much, he's going to, but he will be, a, as far as the skills levels, yeah. as far as dance, Knowing the music, he's gonna learn from all the masters. You know, he's gonna That's have so all that. He's gonna take it to the next level. Yeah. Right? But he just won't go through the same struggle. I don't want him to. Right. No, <laughs> you know? that's why you went through everything you did. Yeah, to go through. I don't want him to. Like when I was ten years old, I was out out and out and about in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So what's the next level for you? Next level for me, as far as for me or for all the culture. For you. Because I think what you do embraces and challenges the culture in itself. So that's kind of... Next level for me is to education. Mm. I want more like me and some of the old, even with the fire business, I want to like yeah. help as many rookies I can. I want to like help them instead of making them like, you don't belong here. You're not good enough. Right. Let's find out if you are good enough. Yeah. Let's see. I love that. So everything that we're doing here with the 110% athlete is finding like what is good and how can I make that even better? How can I make you shortcut some of the avenues where the struggle that we don't have to go through, but you still have that strength. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what are your, what what your assets are. What are you good at? Let's focus on that. And what are your weaknesses? And let's make you better instead of like, ah, you're not good enough. I love that. You already, you're your tool. You're already there. Yeah. So might as well sh- sharpen you and you use. A hundred percent. I agree. Know? So I rather have, you know, like, so, in in also in a breaking scene, like, to have this culture, like, like to make athletes. Yeah. You know, like with these kids, so, some parents were like, I don't think my son is athletic. So we don't know that. Right. You know. <laughs> So let's bring them in and yeah. like, like get them in shape and, and let's then, see. Yeah, let's see. But if you don't like, if you make mm-hmm. him give up already, he's only been in class for like two months. Correct. Some some were slower than others. Yeah. You know, but some like slower than others. But when they peak, <laughs> exactly. they're amazing. <laughs> it is. It's fascinating to watch. Yeah. And so you're also talking about the influence within the parent dynamic as well. So a lot of these athletes growing up 
are having to see it through idols because they're hearing it on the back channel, not just yeah. through like um, positional from like the firehouse, you know, all of those trainers that are saying like, you, you're not good enough, you're going to quit, yeah. get into your head. But these kids are hearing it at don't, home. Yeah, don't give up to them. Don't, right. don't give up too soon. Like a lot of my school teachers, they gave up on me. Like, oh, are you going to be in jail <laughs> the way you are? I said, nah, I think it's because you're boring. Right. You're not teaching me. You're just like, I'm not, not at my I'm energy not, level. <laughs> I'm not like, yo, I'm not into you. Right. The teachers, is a, it's a relationship. It's, it's a communication. Absolutely. Yeah. And if the kids find you boring, they're not going to lie to you. They're like, you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> you know, they're not honest. So, yes. and they take that personally when I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't like what you're teaching. Somehow right. you're making me fall asleep and I'm talking to this girl in class <laughs> because I don't want to pay attention to you. Right. That's your fault. Correct. If I failed in high school, it was your fault. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not that I was, I'm not smart. You know right. what I mean? But you say like, He's oh. He's challenging you, me. Yeah. You, yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. so now with, with the kids, I'm like, yo, if, if, if you're not good at what you do, it's because I gave up on you. Mm. I promise. If I you like stick that. with me, I don't know how I don't care. If it might take a lifetime. Yeah. You're going to get these moves. Yeah. yeah. How do you help them find it in themselves? Because what you're talking about, so there's four sources of confidence mm -hmm. that we develop it through. So some of it is, the coach telling me that I'm really good at what I can do or I can be good at it. So I'm, I'm taking in your words and believing them as my own. Now that's great. But if I'm wanting to have confidence developed across time, um, I really want that intrinsic type of confidence, certainty that I can do these. And we're talking about motivation and confidence in that same realm. So how do you help them also find it within themselves? Cause yours is pretty strong, which is why you're like, what do you mean? Well, I'll just, I'll help you. But like, you're gonna feed off of me, but how do we find that internally for ourselves? What do you think? What would you say? It, it's it's showing them that it's not giving up on them. Mm. You, you they have to be around it. I call it soul power, right? Yeah. They have to be around it. So if you, um, the only way to me is to get it. Like I said, like I got a new student uh, that came in. I said we have times that are we have an open hour. Yeah. Where kids practice together. Right. And then we also do things together like families. Mm. You have to show up for those. Yeah. It's pretty much being part of the family and a brotherhood. For sure. Once the crew and these kids, I tell the kids, yeah. I don't care what they're doing. In, once they're inside the circle, yeah. you cheer for them. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they're doing whack or right. You cheer for them because in that circle is how you get that confidence. For sure. Go. Go, yeah. go, go! Yes, yes. Even, even if it was, if, if it, even if, it, especially if they just started. Oh, for sure. That's Absolutely. when you pour the love. You're igniting it. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you pour the that love. That's hilarious. When you came in earlier, we were talking about the exact same thing. They were like, "We should just start clapping for whoever comes in, <laughs> yeah, like get them yeah. built up, and yeah, then like so you walk in." Once the kid, the the kid feels that, I am a superstar. For some reason, I just became a superstar. Yeah. Without even knowing the moves. Right. But once you got and the moves. And all of a sudden their body is like more upright. Like, yes. I, I, okay. Yes. I got this. Yes. <laughs> and you can see it in yes. their body language. So once that confidence is built, I am willing to try anything you tell me to. Yep. Because there's a belief that has now been established. Yes. Absolutely. I am willing to fall and you will catch me. Correct. And now we're talking about trust. Yeah, trust, right? Yeah. And so, Okay. <laughs> So they, I, oh, they always ask me, how did breaking get into the Olympics? I'm going to tell you. So Ooh, this is good. The first few events I had, so I come from a, a, a gang-infested community. Yeah. Because the B-Boys back in the 80s rebelled and became gang members. Mm. Because for re police brutality, discrimination. Right. So I'm like, you don't push these kids yeah. because they will group up oh, yeah. and they will turn on you. Yep. And you lock them up. That's college for mm -hmm. them. To do sure. more crimes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what is. I mean? Absolutely. So you don't do that. You embrace them for what they want to do as oh, far yeah. as art. But back in the 80s, it, it, Austin was different. Yeah. They would break at, uh, at the mall. You're trespassing. Can't be doing that here. They would break downtown 6th Street. Trespassing. You can't yeah. do that here. You get a ticket. Right. So they just rebelled. Now they're from having eight members. They have 30 members. They're not breaking on the floor. They're breaking people's faces because they're so oh, angry. Yeah. yeah. Right. And just constantly. I notes. always tell people like whenever I used to have a crew in, in high school and we'll go out and dance and people will hate on me. And I'm like, you see this energy I have on the floor. Right. 
It can be on the on your face yep. or on the floor. Mm-hmm. And there's 30 of us. Right. You're not going to win. No. You know what I mean? Right. So let me express my energy and let it out on the floor. Right. So that was, that's what I always said. We needed a place. So what I did was create um, these events for them to go to and practice. Yeah. They had a reason to practice. Oh, that's so good. Right. And the first few events, there was I had, I had to get security metal detectors. Wow. You know, because these kids are bringing yeah. in weapons. And so right. It was around 90, 98. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And 10 years later, there's no more metal detectors. I don't even have security anymore. Wow. So once the stress of streets yep. was gone, now the, the levels of skills go up. Started going mm-hmm. up. They were getting better because now I don't have to worry about somebody right. fighting outside in the streets, For sure. getting jumped, or some dudes trying to make me sell drugs. Yeah, I can, I can go to the rack. I can go to practice spots. Yeah, and focus on this. Yeah, and I and then if I win that championship, I can take that money and go to L.A. or go to Europe. Right, and I spread like wildfire. Oh, that spread, is so that awesome. Hip, that positivity just went, went all everywhere. over the world. Isn't it interesting how much faster that level of positivity travels yes. than the energy of the negativity? Yes. And especially when we're talking in groups and teams, we talked about this a little bit earlier in another segment that energy can infiltrate and destroy or create yes. so fast. Yes. And how, what we choose to do with that becomes a choice of ours yes. and how we choose to accept it or to transfer it to somebody else. Yes. And it ignites so much. Yes. Yeah. That's fascinating. And then that's, it lit like when I before I became a firefighter, I traveled the whole world and spread an ass. Oh, that is awesome. Mexico, Hawaii, Asia. I went all over the world and just Yeah. And they embraced me. In in Mexico, we have B Boy City, Mexico. Yeah. And it's going on fourteen years. That's incredible. Fourteen years, right? Yeah. And when I went there, these B boys were like, Rome, that we need we need you in Mexico. Wow. Monterrey, Mexico. Why? They're like in, there needs to be hip hop and b boy. So I went over there. So they're like, we're doing a cartel war. Oh, wow. So, how do we get over there? So, <laughs> so I met up with some b boys in Laredo. Yeah. Snuck me through. And then just, yo, yo just, just don't speak. Just put low hat. And, right. And their uncle. And something. We got there. We got to Monterrey. And they had an event. And it was like, okay. And there were was, there was still gangs. Dang. You know what I mean? There was still yeah. hate. You right. Know, they took it seriously. So I did the same thing. I said, get um, get all the leaders. Yeah. And I was like, you guys need to respect each other. Mm-hmm. Right. Because after the the uh, the battle went to, they took me to this bar. Uh, we were drinking. I go, but the, the guys that were producing the event. Yeah. It was only their crew. Mm. Where are the other crews? Oh, we don't like those guys. What do you mean? How many crews are there? Here? Yeah. Oh, there are like 15 crews. But by 10, I was like, that's, that's 150. Yeah. Right? So I was like, so if you guys come to, so if you're, you're the promoter. You right. T- you, if you can invite all the guys to throw an after party here, all the money that you spent. Yeah. 150 B-boys drinking and having a good time here. Right. Respecting each other. The venue's going to feel that. Mm-hmm. The owner of the venue was like, yo, you, I made some money off these B-Boys. For sure. Right? You do the same thing with a restaurant. Yeah. You do the same thing with a hotel. And then you got to, then you got these. Now you Now here. you have the city backing you up. Correct. Now you can go to the, to the other, other uh, uh, companies and to, yeah. to help you event. Now you have a legitimate event. Now you can go, we can go to the embassy mm. and we can bring international. Yep. It happened. It's 14 years now. That is incredible. Yeah. So he told you guys that he was pretty modest. <laughs> the fact that you've had so much impact, not just here, but worldly, like is incredible. The amount of lives that you've influenced is insane. You yeah. should be really proud of yourself. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I just want to like, want to save lives. Break and save my life. That is awesome. You know what I mean? It saved my life. And now I got a beautiful, beautiful family. And I just continue to. Mm, I can feel you right now. That's yeah. pretty powerful. The one thing that we do here is about like being authentic and vulnerable. 
and that people can see the authenticity of the hard work and the dedication that you have made in this community and around the world. And I just want to say thank you for being here with us and sharing that story. And I'm honored to be next to you and interviewing you. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yes. So much. Thanks. Woo!